Uh, my name is Dom, as Matt introduced. I'm a principal SRE here at AMZX. And today I'm here to talk to you about a complex incident that Matt's already introduced. So <laughs> um, what this was, was a, it, it led a myriad of engineers. And what I mean by that was more than just SRE. This was developers, uh, integration leads, because we couldn't keep renting out of it. Um, and just a bunch of people working together to try to solve a problem that keeps manifesting itself in different ways and symptoms. So with that, we didn't know this, but we were going on an adventure. So Bilbo had an advantage here because he knew what he was doing. Um, his was arguably more dangerous, but at least he knew he was on one. So this required the engineering group to both test their knowledge, opinions, and troubleshooting um, that needed to fan out and fan back in with, with competencies and understandings to resolve complex and intertwined problems. Did that change? No. Right. Cool. So just to start off with, I'll, I'll let me rephrase, to start off with, I'll go through the things we actually took away from this so we can carry through the speech. Um, so one of the biggest things was uh, increased awareness for the engineering group about understanding the problem, but the limitations to actually understand the problem. Um, one of the things we found through this exercise was the tools and uh, tools and solutions we had were actually some of the limitations uh, that we encountered to fix the problems that we were trying to fix. Um, defaults aren't always same, so. I think a lesson from this was to actually question things, even if it's sort of fold, if it appears there by magic, let's think about it and ask why, and does it suit what you're trying to do? Um, Kubernetes resource requests and limits, so I should say. Basically, the learning here was have an opinion, think about it and make it a choice for yourself. Uh, Golang resource leak conditions, we found two of these in different ways, um, and it's just something to be aware of. From, from an SRE perspective. Embracing, pro, embracing profiling. Um, there's no single root cause. And embracing complex system interactions. What did it just do? Cool. Must be. No. The other end? Well, no, it's in a box. <laughs> Trust the box. Um, so the, the premise here, like, we entered this not knowing how deep the rabbit hole was going to go. So the takeaway here is to follow the white rabbit. Cool. So I like astrophysics. So I read Neil deGrasse Tyson's book, and his opening sentence was, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. And I think that kind of applies to distributed systems. Um, so I reworded it, rephrased it. So novel states, complex distributed systems are under no obligation to make sense to you. And so I'm trying to reiterate the point that you need to really think for yourself and think what you want to get out of the system or what it should be doing. And do you have the tools to make sense of it? This is all human effort. You don't get any of this for free. Cool. So let's begin. That thing's in the wrong spot. Uh, early December, we have a service ooming. Um, how did we notice? We weren't alerted. So I think Christoph was you, wasn't it? Digging around for some reason, couldn't keep you out of the systems. Um, but the, re the reason this is an interesting point is because, yeah, the service was ooming, but it was still a healthy service. Our SLOs weren't telling us it was wrong. It was, its latency was fine. Its correctness was fine. Um, the ooming cycle of what you can see on screen was healthy enough to kill the pods and respawn. And given that the service is a pod running on Kubernetes, uh, the, the front end abstraction that is the service remained healthy to end users. So we address this for the sake of hygiene. The engineering inside of us is happy. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right, but then, what happened then? So late December, we get an alert. What the hell has happened here? What's changed? There's no meaningful changes in recent deployments. There's no config changes. Dependencies are happy. Platform is healthy. There's no increased traffic volume. So what's going on? 
what after some digging, there is a, a default value in our Kubernetes manifest that sets a CPU limit. Um, this was not tuned, it was consumed by a framework. And so what's happening now is that we're getting an SLO alert because our service is having latency. It doesn't have enough access. It can't access enough CPU to do its job. But why didn't we see this before if nothing had changed? The ooming was covering this up. So that's layer one. We, we got rid of the oom and we realized we had an SLO potential bug alert living underneath it. Sorry. Nah, what's going on here? So that's the service alerting. That's what should have been on the screen. Apologies. Um, so digging into the Kubernetes limits, like we decided to obviously dig into uh, why are we hitting this limit anyway, even though the default value was too low, um, which led us to follow our nodes. As you do, there's an alert going on. You get on a console, you find a graph, a dashboard. Hey, that looks like it makes sense. We're in the GCP console, but the CPU utilization doesn't make any sense. And why is that? Well, we start to look into it a bit deeper and by default, the GCP dashboards show pod level container utilization of CPU. And then we start to think about it. Oh, we have an Istio sidecar in our pods next to our actual service containers. And so that was a lesson to, again, look deeper and think about things more explicitly instead of just taking what you're given. So the outcome of that was to actually use the Metrics Explorer to dive into something a bit deeper. Right. Um, so we've hit Christmas, we're back early Jan. We thought we should check in on the strange CPU growth. So we changed, sorry, and just to follow on from that, we changed the limit, we upped it, uh, everyone was happy, no alerts, the service was good. Um, so we come back after Christmas and we still have this strange CPU growth. So we check in on it. Um, we decide to just monitor it to see how it looks. It's still in the trajectory to hit the limits, but our traces, logs, and metrics show no reasoning or obvious reasoning for this trigger behavior. I've got to press the button twice. What's going on here? Sorry. Cool. So... While we're thinking about this, we decided to think about how does Go actually look at a CPU? How does it look at, when it's on a node, what does it do in terms of CPU? All right. Yay. Yay. Cool. So there's, a, there's, a, there's two things to unravel here. There's how Go uses CPU and there's how Go uses CPU in Kubernetes. So... Uh, at, a, a, at its truest level, outside of Kubernetes, there's a quota period governed within the kernel um, that is governed by a C group, which is related to a container once it gets into the Kubernetes context. The quota within, there's a, there's a period uh, that the completely fair scheduler governs to do with the kernel, um, and the period is 100 milliseconds. And so for each C group, it says, um, how many cores are you allowed to use for that 100 milliseconds? I need to be careful with the terminology here. Um, Go, by default, will try to be as concurrent as possible. If, if it sees 16 cores, it's going to try to use all the 16 cores, which is perfect if you don't limit it. Um, in the example on screen, there's four cores. Um, so for each 100 milliseconds of quota period, there's 100 milliseconds per core. So that leaves you with 400 milliseconds of CPU to consume per 100 milliseconds. One person's nodding. I managed to phrase that. Oh, two, sorry. Um, so in that context, Go is great when, it's, when it doesn't have a limit. It'll just see everything and try to use as much as possible. So how does that look when we put a limit on it? Well, my son helped me with this diagram and he did the colors and I did the shapes. So it was a teamwork. Um, but what happens here is if we apply a limit now, using the same example as before, we have four cores, but now we limit it to 200 milliseconds per quota cycle. So 200 milliseconds per 100 milliseconds. Sorry if that sounds confusing. But what you can see on screen here 
is R1 equals request one. And really they could be numbered differently because there's a request on each core, as you can see aligned there. But what happens is if, if Go, if we just let it do its thing, it tries to, again, use all the cores it can see. And what it can see four cores and it has 200 milliseconds. So it consumes 200 milliseconds as fast as it can, which over four cores means it consumes it in 50 milliseconds, resulting in throttling. Should I pause the questions or is that okay? So what this happened, what, like a bad part of this is, so the example you can see on the screen, we're gonna say the average request takes 60 milliseconds to serve. So you can see I've sliced the green, the green blobs on the first sort of section. Um, we process 50 milliseconds on all the cores and then we're throttled on all the cores. And then we do the last 10 milliseconds at the start of the next quota round. And then we start with request two. And that pattern flows through and so, what we end up with is inconsist, re, inconsistent request latency, um, potential for dropped health checks. If Kubernetes and whatever else is health checking your service during a period when you're throttled, you're not gonna be able to respond. Um, and then this troubleshooting of container performance becomes more convoluted um, because of this throttling mechanism, which yeah results in basically inconsistencies. So how does that look? So I guess after doing all this research and finding out how this stuff worked, we're like, well, surely there's a way we can use limits and not be throttled. And there is. There's Uber that did Automax Prox. And what it does is you can set it with an environment variable to match the limit being employed by Kubernetes. So now you can tell your Go application to use the same amount of CPUs as you're defining your limits. And what that does there is you can see on the screen on the right hand side, we've defined that we again have 200 milliseconds as a limit for CPU, but now we're setting go max prox to two. So go will go, cool, I've got two cores, I'll use them as fast as I can, which makes sense in this context now. So now we have a much more even latency distribution for each request. You can see the colors match up a bit nicer per the quota period. And that was the ideal outcome and understanding for this point in time. But then we started to think a bit deeper and we said, is limits even the right thing to do on these services? And what this did was open up a massive can of worms across many engineering teams. Um, a giant debate raged on between platforms and SREs and software developers about how limits work and what they can and can't do for each um, use case. And I guess some of the more consistent themes that come from these conversations would be how will it impact KA scheduling? How will it impact performance testing? Um, do we get more efficient use of CPU without limits? And that meaning that if, if I'm a CPU and I don't have a limit, I can consume whatever's free on the node. So that's a cost saving and potentially an ability to handle burst, burstable traffic. Um, how do I impact KA's quality of service? How do I impact developer experience? The consistency of performance is somewhat uh, unstable or inconsistent because there's an amount of uh, unknown amount of headroom per example that I look at that I can consume. How does it work with HPA? And all these questions would circle around all these engineering groups for quite some time. A bit of a recap of where we're at. We started off with an oom bug, and then we discovered we were hitting CPU limits, and we decided to increase the limits. And then we said, do we even need limits? And then under that, prior to that, we also figured out how Go looks at CPU. Um, one of the outcomes was there in terms of the knowledge of the throttling was, hey, we need to figure out how many services are being throttled and by how much. So the need for C advisor metrics was brought up um, out of an operational requirement. We um, realized we didn't have them, so work began to give us that insight. Cool. So early Jan 2023, we're still in early Jan. We're iterating under the next thing we can do, which is CPU is still growing. So we need to keep looking at this from different angles. So we start to think about Go routines and how they act within the service. And then this brings forth another realization is that we don't have Go runtime metrics. Um, so work commences on that, which is another fan out aspect of, of this investigation. So, so far we have a, a, a K8 CPU limit working group almost. Uh, we're doing C advisor metrics and we're doing go runtime metrics to solve the problems we're now aware of. 
But again, we're sitting around waiting for um, these capabilities. We're like, well, what else can we do? Let's look at, can we do a stack trace and understand what's going on in the internals? Um, we decide we want to trigger a core dump, but this brings up another question of how do we do this safely in a K8s environment? How do um, we start to look at our containers and pods and we realize that we use a distress, distro-less, pardon me, OS. So we can't um, kubectl exec in and just kill the pit and generate a core dump. So we become aware of a thing called ephemeral containers. So this is another learning. So we continue to fan out. Ephemeral containers, we can connect to an existing pod and kill the desired PID. Um, I guess an ephemeral container, it's, it's just like a normal container. It doesn't have its, um, sorry, it does have its own spec, but things that aren't included are things like ports, probes, and resources. Um, and so with that, with the knowledge of an ephemeral container, it's a new, uh, uh, new blade in our Swiss Army knife. Is that a bit violent? Um, anyway, so we, now we can create a ephemeral container. We can attach to the target pod. We can tail those pods' logs, and then we can send a kill abort the, um, to the container pit that generates the core dump. We can capture the stack trace, and then we can ensure the container restarts. And that was all the practice to doing this safely in production, which, by the way, we couldn't replicate this issue in non-production. I should have mentioned that earlier. <laughs> And meanwhile, the debate rages on about Kubernetes limits and how they work. Um, at, at one point in time, though, we did decide to change the default. We removed the default to have limits. So let me rephrase that. We removed limits as the default. So now all of our services uh, were deployed, all of our Go services were deployed without limits on the CPU uh, for the reasoning of the ability to capture our new CPU cycles and prevent throttling because we didn't yet have CFI's metrics. So it seemed like the safest, most logical decision to do that. That was the decision while we moved forward with our ADR process. As you can see, it looks like that. Cool. So mid-Jan 2023, um, we made some sense of the stack trace. Uh, and a PR was submitted to use buffered channels instead of unbuffered channel channels because that was the suspect for the CPU growth that was continuing. The PR makes production, pardon me, and we review, but the, C, the linear CPU growth continues. So we start to think about other leaks. This was one leak identified. Can we test leaks for the? Can we test for leaks across all code bases? Like maybe we miss something. So again, we employ the use of Uber's Go leak, but find nothing meaningful. Early Feb 2023, we have a level up. We have C advisor metrics enabled in prod. Albeit this is no longer relevant because we changed our decision with Kubernetes requests and limits, <laughs> but it's a new capability nonetheless. So if anyone does have limits, we can look at this stuff and see if we're getting throttled. So that's one outcome. Moving on, we decide to do profiling. We turn on profiling in production and pretty much straight away within a day or two, we revealed that we have uh, ticker dot stop growing in uh, memory. So this guy, looking into the research, we never did a, a defer stop, um, defer ticker dot stop. I should say sorry. Um, so this appears. This this was the root cause, the single cause, one of the causes of um, contributing cause. Contributing cause was the phrase I was looking for of the C linear CPU growth that we couldn't figure out how, why it was growing. So this was deployed, this was identified, um, the third ticker stop was remediated within this particular code base. It was deployed to production and the metrics that previously indicated the issue were no longer there. We did found the most pivotal bug that we were trying to chase. But what this also enabled us to do was write a custom linter that looked for these cases. So that was done by one of our other SREs deployed, I think it was within our CI, we called another um, repository that had the same issue, but it hadn't um, revealed itself in production yet. So that was another outcome we got from this. And I've talked before the slides come up there. That was to do with the custom linter. On so outside of that, we had Go runtime metrics, finally, out of the box. So now we could look at Go routines. Um, again, too late, but another capability gained. 
And that sort of brings us to the, the final section of the slide. So here's the whole mind map of stuff we went through on this journey. So we started with an OOM, we went to CPU limits, and then we went to increase the limits. And then we diverted our decision and thinking, do we even need limits? Which, by the way, we ended up going with, no, we don't, but we can use them if you, if you need them necessary. For example, in P and V, when in load tests, when you're looking for consistent performance and resource consumption, that's probably when they're useful. Uh, but by default, they're not there. So under that, we learned how Go uses CPU, how we detect throttling when we needed C advisor. We got that as a capability. We looked at CPU linear growth that required turning on, um, sorry, that required generating a stack trace manually from a Kubernetes uh, context, which required ephemeral containers, um, which required a safe process to do that in production. We learned about Go routines. We got runtime metrics that support them now so we can review that characteristic of our services. And then finally, we got brave enough to turn on profiling. And that was the answer in the end to the most pivotal issue in this operational investigation. We did a PR, we got a custom CI linter out of it, and everyone was happy. So to sum up, um, defaults aren't always same. You need to look at them and question them. And should they be there? Is that setting even correct? You need to understand, the, do you have the capability to understand the problem, I guess is one of the bigger takeaways. Like, do you need more tools to understand this problem and make the most informed decision? And it's okay to take a step back and as you can see on the screen, think and branch out in parallels. You don't have to go straight ahead and solve the issue. Um, in that related context, it, it's a great opportunity to embrace the ability like the business driven ability to go understand these systems and services at such a low level as well. Um, as I said at the start, Kubernetes requests and limits. It's important to have an opinion and your own opinion that suits your services and needs. Golang uh, leak resources, we looked at how that can happen. Don't be scared of profiling and there's no single root cause. And to round it out, Bilbo has a quote that works off the quote from the start. And it's your obligation to understand what's required to reason about the state of your complex systems. Thank you. Well, many people that were involved in that whole thing uh, that are in this room. So if there's any questions. Yeah, is there any questions? Very technical deep dive. If there's any questions and we've got a bit of time, and a whole bunch of engineers that want to show off how smart they are. Uh, I think feel free to ask. No. No. Cool. I have a very basic question. Maybe it doesn't make sense. That diagram you showed at the CPU that we were having to use, I don't know if you could bring it back up. I think it was the first one that you showed or the second. The one that had the requests labeled as like R1. I was just wondering why R1 wasn't. Yeah, that one. This guy? So why is R1 not finished in that first 100 milliseconds? Why doesn't each... So for the on the right-hand side of the screen, the example being walked through, requests take about 60 milliseconds to serve. Oh, okay. And the reason I chose that figure is because it broke the whole um, neat numbers of 50, 100, 200. Yeah. Might work on the labelling of those. Uh, so my son, son did the labels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you think about that first column as R1, R2, R3, R4, rather than R1 request cycle. You can see that it's four times 50 equals 200 milliseconds. So at that point, boom, you stopped. And so you're now waiting, now, now your, your, your throttle paused for 50 seconds of dead CPU time, just for you to pick up the, the next plus 10, next 40 milliseconds. So your 60, second, your 60 millisecond request is now actually taking 110 milliseconds because you're accidentally using all four cores. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Any question from those online? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what were you using for your GoPro Um, I think just... Out of the box, so sorry for those online. The question was, what are we using for our Go profiling? Um, I think out of the box, we're just using PProf, um, maybe some additional wrappers around uh, how we trigger it on with GCP to make sure our labeling and things like that are correct, the metadata around it. 
um, that Christoph, you might even know, is it just Peprov? Yeah, so nothing special. Uh, there is an actual agent that we need to deploy, though, to talk to GKE profiling. So that might do extra stuff, yeah. Any other questions? What was the exact issue there, Peter? Pardon? The ticker had an issue. What was, uh, what was that? So the question for those of mine was the ticker had an issue, but what was it? So the we didn't defer ticker stop. So we, we ticker started, went and did our stuff, and if that go routine exited early, it just hung around. Okay. So when you start your ticker, uh, the, run, the run time actually spawns a go routine under the under the hood. So there's just a bunch of secret go routines that are not very obvious for anybody that's... If you read the go docs, it actually just straight up says every time you start a ticker, <laughs> please stop it. Um, <laughs> maybe another takeaway for us. <laughs> That's it? <clears throat> ah, sorry. Controversial one. So if you decided to start the program again, would you choose Go as the program language, knowing what you know now? Or would you use something that was, let's say, a bit more seasoned and a bit more mature and a bit more expertise in the, in the, in the business um, to, to develop your programs? Example? Python. Python. <laughs> so the question for those online was, if we could do it again, would we do this stuff in Go? Would we choose a more mature language, which was recommended as Python? We, we probably would have chosen Rust. Whatever, whatever it may be. No, 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 Rust is not <laughs> no mature either. <laughs> um, the, the answer is yes, but not in Go. Yeah. So we would have chosen Python No, but the problem is the maturity of the support that you can get from the other people within the community. Uh, Go is pretty mature as product, let's say, but not as many people are, are using Go. So when it comes to support online, support from the community, it's not as predominant as something like Java, Python, uh, let's say, uh, you know, JavaScript, whatever it may be, there's a bigger presence online. For, for Kubernetes microservices. Yeah. It's worth noting on the well, question. For the programming anyway. It's, it's worth noting on the question too, like the JDK has only been C group aware for a very short period of time too. So while while the Uber Max, the Max Prox library now gives you that ability and there's still nothing in the standard Go library that gives you this, the JDK has only been, has only been C group aware as well. And I think if you look at, other financial institutes and their program, their primary languages. It's a lot of Java, um, and there's still the, the whole environment. I do have one controversial question before we end. I was just going to say Java has the same uh, behavior out of the box. Yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. was the capabilities that we got worth it? for fixing an OO that had no impact to our service level objectives. <laughs> Given the hundreds and hundreds of engineering hours of engineering effort and the previous zero impact to customers that we were seeing by our service level objectives. <laughs> we should have left it. <laughs> Is that a question for me? Sorry. Uh, so the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I think the knowledge gained from the whole experience was um, like we're much more aware. I think it's a level of maturity that's been attained through it as well. Like we, we understand the nuts and bolts of Go a lot more and Kubernetes a lot more. Is, is Kubernetes the right choice? We're able to talk about those things now um, and question things more deeper based on the learnings we've had from here. And we take this kind of approach into the future. So... No. <laughs> Wait, so no, we shouldn't have fixed the oom or? We should have fixed the oom. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs>